Hey, good morning, Sunrise family. Happy Sunday. It's great to see you all. This is the third Sunday of the month, and we kind of do a, a missions focus. We, we've been a, a missions church for many years, and, and we could get into a little talk about what that definition is right now, but we, that's for another time. But we are blessed. We support awesome missionaries all around the country, and even right here in Fallbrook, and there's ways to get involved. And I'm with Brad Fox. Many of you that have been at Sunrise for a lot of years have, have recognized Mr. Fox here. He's been a school teacher here in Fallbrook. He's done all kinds of stuff. I've known you, I don't know how many years, because we both have lot grayer of, hair. Years. Yeah, a lot of grayer hair. But um, on, you're going to miss, we've got six other people that are going to be at our live service. But today we've got just Brad, and Brad's going to be doing an interview of some things that are going on in and around the community that Brad's involved in that the Lord led him to. But before we get started in any way, shape, or form, I always love to do this, no matter who I'm talking to. How did you... Brad Fox, come to Christ. Oh, I was born into it, Greg. Yeah, I was, I was baptized into it. I didn't know I was wet. Uh, yeah, I've been a Christian for 75 years. Uh, I don't know anything different. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, is it parents? Is that what it was? Oh, parents, yeah, brought me to Christ. Uh, grew up in the church, Lutheran church. Uh, 
two years of confirmation every Saturday morning, two hours, homework. Uh, I wasn't into academics at that time, but there was something attractive about how my Old Testament senior pastor and my New Testament associate pastor presented Christ to me, and I thought, wow, this is beyond anything I've ever experienced. Yes. I need to know more about who Jesus is and who God is. Wow. Yeah. So 75 years. Yeah. So you're following Christ, and then as you got a little bit older, you actually didn't you enlist or were you drafted into the service? Because I, I know you served our nation. Yeah, enlisted uh, was like a lot of youth of the turbulent late 60s, a little bit adrift. <laughs> uh, signed up in high school in the Navy Reserve, promptly broke my leg and was postponed a couple of years oh, with a you know pin in my leg and then got that taken out and then I was off to service in Vietnam and the Philippines for a couple of years. Wow. So, so then you came back from that. Is that yeah. when you started pursuing, I think, I, I want to be a teacher? Or, or what happened oh, from no, then? No, my <laughs> trip to uh, education was convoluted. I, teaching and education was the last place I ever wanted to be, Greg. I had a lot of <laughs> difficulty um, after I was doubly promoted in fourth grade. Never went to fourth grade. Wow. Uh, it's all part of the um, space race, the uh, Sputnik launch of mm -hmm. 1957. And so I was put into a peer group that was older than me, and it really threw me for a tizzy. Didn't really recuperate until I came back from Vietnam, wow. and at that point in time, I was super motivated to uh, improve myself and uh, find out the purpose of my life. Wow. Yeah. And that's, so like, so I know you said it was convoluted, so seriously, how did you, I mean, I know you from being a math teacher here at junior high school right. a, in Fallbrook, for, you, know, you taught there for many years. Yeah, actually, I uh, got into lab science, uh, did that for a number of years, probably eight years, found out that I was a people person, and basic research is not a people uh, <laughs> profession. Uh, decided that, hey, I really didn't have a plan B, so I decided, well, I'd always wanted to build my own house, so I got into construction for six years, learned how to do that, built my own house, and then asked myself, is that all there is? <laughs> and of course, in the meantime, I'm uh, teaching classes at church, First Presbyterian in Oceanside. I'm teaching uh, elementary school students, got involved heavily in the youth group there, taught adults, led uh, seminars with adults, uh, very involved in the adult um, ministry there, and uh, had people come to me and say, wow, you're really good with the kids. They really like you, and I'm like, uh, talk to the hand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm not, Careful. no, I don't, I don't do education. I'll learn. I like learning, but I don't want to be responsible for kids, and, and I had a lot of pain with education. So guess what? The Lord says, I can use that pain. Right. I can use that for empathy and sympathy and compassion in the classroom. That's right. And once I um, took teacher training and got involved, I mean, I started at age 41. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a good age to start teaching at, but uh, I couldn't have started earlier. Uh, right. I had been a dad that, by that time for about 14 or 15 years. I kind of knew the developmental sequence. So, yeah, I had yeah, a, exactly. So you had the kids. You had the first-hand <clears throat> experience there. Yeah. Coming from a gifted and talented background myself, I knew that segment of the population. But I also have a 71-year-old disabled brother who made me compassionate towards uh, underachieving students, students who are struggling. Right. And um, it turned out I was probably the best fit, the best thing I could have ever done with my life. So, so do you ever sit back and talk to the Lord about, wow, what a journey you've had me on? And because and, yeah. we talk about, you know, Hebrews 12, 1 always says, you know, run the race set before you. We have to, and, mm -hmm. and your race is different than my race. We all have our different journeys. Right. But as we get older, sometimes we reflect and you talk to the Lord and think, wow, that was amazing. Thank you. Do you ever have oh, it? <laughs> constantly, continuously. I, I, as they say on social media, SMH, shake my head. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like, wow, you got me here through all of that. And uh, even now extending my uh, life into a whole new area of uh, homeless ministry. Yeah. So yeah, kind of surprised, but 
but not surprised. I mean, God just does amazing things he does. with people. Yeah. Well, I remember uh, an experience you and I had. You and I, together with a group of men from, from this church, a long time ago, went to a Promise Keeper event up in Los oh Angeles. Oh, my. You're going back. Yeah. But I, the, yeah, so the reason is I, I want to tie it in because, you know, you talk about you weren't necessarily thinking that the Lord is calling you into working with children and all that stuff, mm-hmm. but you're, you're, you're very inner, uh, very relational person. Mm-hmm. And I've known you to be that way, but I'll never forget because I kind of knew you, but mm-hmm. I, I knew you were the teacher. I knew people, I knew the students that had mm-hmm. you. And, and until I got to hang out with you with a, a group of guys where we were focused on the Lord, I never, I, I, I started appreciating you in a, in a whole new way. Mm-hmm. And then I saw you wrestle other guys. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, there's the off kilter part of my personality. I, being a junior high teacher, some of that spills into my, you know, <laughs> my my way of acting but i yeah i kind of that's probably why i identify so strongly with the youth is because i never grew up (laughs) what i love about that is it's always stuck with me and i'm even getting goosebumps now from the holy spirit because it reminds me of how paul you know said he's striving to be all things to all people in the name of the lord not in his own strength but in the strength of the lord Mm -hmm. and i think that's one of your gifts from me looking at you objectively after all these years you've Wow. You're able to adapt, and the Lord has given you ways to, you can talk to junior hires, but you can talk to highly educated people across mm. the board. You can talk to the homeless. You can talk to the organizations that care for homeless and try right. to, and I know sometimes that's difficult because you're trying to reason with certain things. Yeah. But to see you do that, from my perspective, I just want to, again, say thank you that you've been obedient. Wow. I know you're not perfect. I know that. Mm-hmm. Neither one of us are. That's why we have a Savior. But to see the things, I mean, Brad, you were named Citizen of the Year here in Fall Rick mm. a couple of years ago. Yeah. God, God blessed you with, with uh, some accolades and teaching too, Teachers of the Year. Mm-hmm. But when, I, when it comes right down to it, to see you with little ones or see you with someone's on the street that doesn't know what's mm. going to happen next, you're, you're comfortable there too. Give me an, is, that, is that something you just feel like God's gifted you with? Or have you had to work on that to be able to talk to all different people? Or? Um. I'm inherently a um, introvert. I was probably till I was in my mid 30s, early 40s. Wow. Uh, teaching definitely brought that out of me. It's sink or swim. Mm-hmm. You have to relate to the to your audience, to the kids, and uh, yeah, it's usually a gulp moment for me. But um, if you do it enough times, it becomes very comfortable. It becomes. Yeah. Hmm, I wonder how the Lord's going to reach out to me through this person. Right. Because I usually almost always get more from an encounter than the other person a- does. Absolutely. I yeah. think so many times we all walk away going, oh man, I'm so blessed that yeah. we had this opportunity. The, the story, the, the Bible is the living word. It's, it's not a story about other people and their experience with God and you figure out your own story. No, it's alive and living in our lives and on our streets today. So I just join him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it goes back to remember that Bible study we did years ago, Henry Blackaby experiencing oh God. And, and I think yeah. that really helped a lot of us to understand that, though, he, we're blessed to be able to come alongside of him. He'll show you where he's at work. And m- many times he just says, just step out, join me here. Right. You know, when he calls you uh, to a work, he's inviting you to know himself. Mm -hmm. And he's calling you to a work that you can't do. (laughs) You will fail miserably in your own strength and understanding. Only he, if he intervenes, will make that work come to fruition. So, yeah, I'm signed on to the Experiencing God uh, curriculum. I I speak to that often in my ministry and my writings. Uh, Yeah, that changed my whole thinking. Oh, well, me too. And, and I just think, and it also, I think the Lord opens our eyes to everyday situations in a way that I feel like sometimes we miss out on knowing that we're ringside to a miracle oh, at wow. any given moment. Yeah. And so, so I, so now fast forward now, a few years back, you felt like you're supposed to start a homeless advocacy group here in Fallbrook. Right. Okay. So how it did actually that? started, you know, 2005, I'm on a, a youth mission trip to uh, Ensenada, Mexico from this church, and uh, we were at La Bufadora, which is a tourist spot. It's an ocean blowhole spray and everything go up. Lots of um, uh, shops and restaurants and uh, touristy traps. And I had this man come up to me and ask me for money, a homeless 
Mexican man, and I was the only Spanish speaker on the trip, and I speak at about a third grade level, but I can kind of understand what people are saying. And so I had enough understanding about homelessness that I, I never give money. I'll buy food or clothing or whatever. I want to make sure that it goes to the material need that that person has, and now the spiritual need. But in those days, uh, I met him with a, a meal, and the students came up to me. These are senior high school students, and they're asking me, hey, Foxy, that's how they always refer to me, what's this about? Who's this guy? Why are you talking to him? You know how students are. Uh, yeah. And I said, well, he's homeless, and he lives over here in a field, and he's he asked me for uh, some money. I gave him some food. We're going to take him home in our van. And it was kind of quiet in the van on the way over. I bet. And then we got out, and I had a, a Holy Spirit moment in which I could have just shook his hand and said, you know, God bless you, and it would have, been have a nice again. life. But I thought, no, don't miss this event. And I had the students get out, and we formed a circle around him, holding hands. And uh, I prayed in Spanish, I prayed in English best I could, and man, it galvanized those kids. They didn't know anything about homelessness. They were aghast that such a thing could actually exist, exist yeah. in, you know, even in Mexico. We met a man later in the um, mission trip who we found out through, uh, conversation uh, one of the girls had offered him a rose and he graciously accepted it and then he uh, she asked this is little Branche Foster oh, I, I remember Branche. you know Branche uh, she will get the job done <laughs> and she said to me can you ask him if I can hug him Wow. and uh, through my broken Spanish I asked him and he said yes I'd very much like to be hugged I haven't been touched in 25 years. Wow. And man, you talk about being a 50 kilovolt uh, transmission line. I knew I had to tell the students what he just said, but in the moment I thought, this is gonna melt them. Yeah. And it did. And uh, they continued their, we did hug him, we embraced him. There was not a dry eye. The kids looked at me like, is this even possible happened, in yeah. this world? Yeah. Haven't been touched. And so they came back to their school. Uh, we started and started witnessing at their school. We uh, started a mission in uh, downtown San Diego, East Village near Petco Park, uh, when things got too dangerous in uh, Tijuana to pass through. So we started that with uh, City of Refuge. Mm -hmm. We would go down on Friday nights and uh, do street ministry. And it was ba basically a um, university of the streets. And we basically talked to uh, homeless people on the street. We found out about their lives. We found out how to be sensitive to their lives. We sat on their level, stayed off of their cardboard. Uh, a lot of it was stories, personal stories. Got to know who they were, where they were from, what their family was like what their growing up experience was like. And we had one woman who uh, really schooled me. I, this was a tutorial <laughs> in which I asked Bernice, uh, how long have you been homeless? Because I have my repertoire of questions. Sure. And she looked at me like I was speaking Greek, and she said, I'm not homeless. And I thought to myself, well, I didn't say this to her, but I thought, you're sitting on cardboard, ma'am, with a bedroll and a backpack and the hygiene pack that I just gave you, you're sitting in old crummy clothes, and I thought, if there's anybody that's homeless, it's you. But she answered very graciously, very understanding of where I was where coming were, from. Yeah. She says, I'm not homeless. That guy over there, he takes care of me when there's a, a physical threat. And that lady over there, she uh, will loan me money at the end of the month if I run out. And those, that couple over there, they'll share their food with me. They're my home. Wow. She says, I'm not homeless, I'm houseless. Wow. And so I think a lot of people in our culture don't get the difference. Yeah. But as Christians, we're homeless. You know, we don't, we're, we're strangers in a foreign land. That's right. 
and our home is with the Lord, we should get that. But the, the society, culture is saying, oh no, it's all about the housing. And I'm saying, well, yeah, it is. People need a roof over their heads. They need comfort and clothing and cleanliness and nutrition. But they also need relationship. And that's what we provide for our men at the, uh, the homeless transition house. So in 2017, I had a couple of members of church come up to me and ask, what's going on with the homeless here in town? And I didn't have an answer. I was very much immersed in uh, the homeless culture and uh, you know homeless mission work, but it was downtown. San Diego, yeah. San exactly. Diego, and I knew it could be importable to uh, Fallbrook, but I hadn't started anything. So in 2017, we started a street outreach, was basically um, giving food and clothing, uh, uh, professional counseling through the county uh, offices. Uh, we had bicycle repair, we had haircuts, we had showers, basically meeting all the material needs of these people. And uh, that worked for a while until we had this uh, Thursday in March of 2020 where the governor shut the state down. Oh, that time, yes. The, the, the night before our monthly outreach, so we had to stop that. And now coming out of COVID, uh, you know, we we managed the house. Uh, we started the house in about 2019. We managed the house, but it was kind of a cloistered society because of uh, COVID. And uh, since then, we've kind of opened up. We've uh, I've been more intentional about helping the men with their their job transitions. Uh, uh, what we're going to talk about here in a minute is feeding them on. Uh, monthly Sundays or, or actually weekly Sundays, providing a, a nutritious meal, but also the family relationship because Relation. a lot of what they don't have is a social network. You know, all the things we take for granted, right. uh, who's a good doctor in town, do you need an attorney, uh, where do I go to get a loan, where are the jobs, they don't have that connection right. that we have. And, and it's invisible to us, we don't know we have it, we just assume it's there. So uh, I've been focusing on that. And, you know, when you get into mission work, the thing that you think is the thing, it's not the That's thing. Right, yeah. Okay, so you focus on, on helping the men. And then as you bring people from the community in to serve them, you realize, oh, wait a minute, this is a higher level. People are getting changed. Yeah, the men are getting taken care of and well, but it's the people's lives are being changed. They're understanding what it means to be homeless and it changes their, their worldview. Sure. Okay, so. So I like what you said though, it's, there's, it's relational. Everything's mm -hmm. relational. And, and when you just were telling me that, leading into that relational situation where you think with these men, it goes back to that gentleman you met in Mexico. I haven't been yeah. touched in 25 years. Yeah. And you know, sometimes touch is a physical touch, sometimes just touch, having a conversation with somebody oh, yeah. so so and, and I know you said we're going to talk about feeding and stuff like that and and so that's with the with our group that you're going to be talking to mm -hmm. what what would you say your goal is to communicate with that panel to the church and and beyond because we get a lot of people mm -hmm. that watch us around the country what would you say about your yeah. goal would be with this talk tomorrow I think uh, what I'd like to say is that there's um uh, biblical meaning behind what we're asking people to do. This is not a one-off, hey, something nice to do for your community, a, a service, a mission project. Mission is not a project. It's not a, a one-time thing. It's, okay. a, it's a lifestyle, okay? So uh, I take my uh, commission from the Bible. You know, there's some important questions in Genesis, and one of the <laughs> questions is, from uh, God to Cain, where's your brother? <laughs> and God knew. Sure. God knew. And uh, of course, Cain responded, How am I supposed to know? Typical, like, teenager type answer. How am I supposed to know? What am I? My brother's keeper? That's right. Well, caring for my 71 year old disabled brother, I know that was, he indicted himself with that answer. So the, the question or the answer for that should have been, you're not his keeper, Cain, you're his brother. 
totally different situation. Mm -hmm. You're not his caretaker. You're not there just to meet his bodily needs. You're there to have relationship with him, yeah. uh, to be sacrificial for him. So I think about that, and then I think about the people in the Bible that were homeless. Well, Cain's parents were homeless <laughs> when they came out yeah. of the garden. Yeah. They had to no, go. Exactly. They were in relationship with God. They lost that relationship. They lost that homing. And the people I look at in the Bible that were uh, nominally homeless, like Moses for 80 years, yeah. David for several years in the caves, Elijah at the brook of Kidron, uh, Ruth coming from Moab to a strange culture, uh, looking at Rahab after the destruction of her Jericho home. Right looking at Christ himself, who said he had nowhere to lay his head, looking at Paul, who gave up everything and was on the road, uh, and all the apostles. Man. They gave up their housing, their geographic security, the roof over their head for a relationship. And it, they were all homed. They all had the confidence and the security of a relationship with God mm -hmm. or with Christ himself. And so I look at that and I think, okay, uh, homelessness is more than just the housing. Yeah. Uh, I look at the story of the Good Samaritan and the two churchmen that, that passed the beaten man on the road. And I think the question they probably asked themselves was, uh, what will happen to me if I help him. If, if I help. Like if I help right. him. Because there's, the bandits are still in the, in the area, you sure. know, and yeah. it's like, if I tarry here too long, I could be at risk. The Samaritan comes along, the hated one, the skinhead, the Antifa guy, mm -hmm. the, the neo-Nazi, he comes by and he says, hmm, not only what will happen to me if I stay, if I stay and help him, but what will happen to him if I don't help him. Right. Well, that's more of an empathic, more of a compassionate question. But he went beyond that and he asked himself, uh, what will happen to me if I don't help him? Because the Samaritan, I suspect, was a businessman. He probably had to travel that Jericho Road several times a year, if not per month. And every time he walked by that bend in the road, the man would be gone, of course. Some fate would have taken care of him. But he probably had to ask himself, would have had to ask himself, wonder what happened to that guy. Sure. What's happened to my feeling about my fellow man? How can I represent to my children the love of God if I don't do this kind of thing? Yeah. So I, I challenged our congregation. It's been over a year ago. I yeah. said, Ask that last question. What will happen to you if you don't help? Because we're all accountable, just like Cain was accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, Pastor Jerome taught a really excellent sermon series about Daniel. And one of the things that struck me about Daniel was that not only did he have to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream, right. like Joseph had to interpret uh, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's dream, dream. Yeah but he had to tell Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was. Now that's, as I say in gaming, that's next level. That is, yeah. And uh, the thing about Daniel that Jerome brought out was that he was very deferential to the king. He didn't put him down. He didn't raise his eyebrows like, you fool. Right. But, yeah. And he was very upfront. He said, there's no one that can answer that question, no human, but there is a God who knows what you dream, and he actually knows what the interpretation of that dream was, is. So he, he went with his, uh, his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He prayed with them, mm -hmm. and he prayed uh, for the king and for the magicians and soothsayers and astrologers. He prayed for them, uh, just like it says in Jeremiah 29, 7, bless the community that you're in exile in. Well, we're exiles and we're in this community. We're no longer respected because we're, we're cloistered. We need, when we go out, we 
expose people to who Christ is mm -hmm. and to his actions. So he, he prayed over uh, the other men that were struggling with this dream. He spoke, spoke truth to power. And uh, he basically said, uh, I can interpret this dream for you, but it's God who gives the interpretation. Right. He gave God the credit. Absolutely. So um, likewise, we need to give God the credit and the community needs to see us as Christians, as missionaries, as prophetic Daniels. We need to be out in the community doing God's work and showing, not just telling, not just reciting Bible verses. We've been through that. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be acting out what the biblical wisdom is for the community. Uh, government's not getting the job done. They don't have that biblical vision. Citizens, uh, secular citizens, have basically put up their hand and said, you know, that's somebody else's job. I'll pay to do that, but I'm getting tired of paying. Right. So um, our culture sees homelessness as a nightmare. And do you, do you think part of that, though, Brad, is, and I don't think it's a bad thing to be cautious, because I think there's some people that are fearful of the homeless, kind of like, uh, and believe me, I'm not trying to uh, say that the Samaritans and those guys that walked by, maybe they're really afraid because of something that happened in the past and you're afraid to step out again. I think when I talk to people, that's, a lot of people are just afraid of homeless because they, well, they could have a knife on them. They could do that. They mm -hmm. could, and sometimes you go, and they could also have not been touched for 25 years. Mm -hmm. and, and so I always, I try, tell, I try to encourage people, ask the Lord how you're supposed to interact right now in this moment. Mm -hmm. But know full well that it's for us humans. Oh, oh no, I, I can't do that. Where's Brad Fox? Yeah, right. Brad, Brad, Brad could do the this. Or, or bring Greg. Greg can't help. You know, yeah. and and we are yeah. we're trying to tell. Well, and that's why we <clears throat> soften the the first encounter. We what I'm asking people to sign up for, and I invite our online audience mm -hmm. to do this as well. Absolutely. Uh, you can do it online with Greg or with myself. Go to Fallbrook Homeless Advocacy Facebook page, and I'll post the opportunities available there. But uh, <clears throat> we're trying to soften the first encounter with the homeless. We all have our stories, but we concrete those stories into existence. It's like if you've had a bad experience with a homeless person, one, that's what homelessness is for you. Right, that's the whole definition. That's the whole definition. And there are those bad experiences out there. And I struggle with those as well. Uh, but we want to invite people to serve a meal to our homeless guys um, one, one Sunday of the week, 11 a.m., prepare a meal off-site. And then, you know, that nourishes them, and that's a good deal. I mean, our guys love to eat. They're carnivores, mainly. <laughs> they won't eat a salad. But... Uh, <laughs> The, the key part of that service is to sit down with them yeah. and start the relationship, create a network, create a new narrative, a new video, mental videotape of, for, the, for the men. Who am I? Right. I'm valued. Mm -hmm. I'm loved. I'm loved by, by Beth and Jen and Ken and Karen and these other uh, people on the panel. Wait a minute. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. I'm just as good as they are. God loves me. There is a God. Yeah. You know, there is a God. And, you know, taking my men through a Bible study, wow, they don't know who Jonah and the whale was. They've heard the name Jesus, but they really don't know what he's about. Right. Exactly. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of rough cutting to do, but there's a lot of blessing uh, to be obtained. And I, I told this to parents of youth group. I said, I'm getting blessings that are meant for you. And they laugh at me. And I think that wasn't funny. Yeah, you're not making a joke. Yeah. I'm not making a joke here. <laughs> yeah. You're you're missing it. So uh, I want to invite people to uh, join us in the, the meal service. You can uh, participate by joining us in our uh, weekly Wednesday and Sunday Bible classes. Uh, you could sponsor a, a recreational trip for the men, maybe go fishing in Oceanside Harbor, rent a boat, take them to a movie, believe it or not, go karting. I mean, <laughs> the sky is the limit, yeah, baseball game, yeah. what have you, you know, take them out to dinner, establish a, an individual relationship with a specific person, 
You could mentor the youth like I did. You could expose youth to who uh, the homeless are. Uh, you can donate. We're not going to turn down donations. But there's so much more, Greg, than just donating. We're called to go, not read up about it, not get ready for it, not talk to others about it. We're told to go. Right. Okay, and this is a very near, uh, uh, geographically near uh, exposure. Same culture, same language. Same, yep. It's about the lowest filter you can put on a mission trip. Right. Okay, but uh, we want to speak to the community about what God's vision for the homeless is. They're they're desperate. We we had a saying in DSF. Uh, this last year, uh, the theme for our studies was to know Christ and to make him known. Yeah, very good. Pretty brief words. How many is that? Five or six words. But uh, we want to make God known through our actions. And people are going to ask. We've got Crossway involved in, um, you know, repairs at the house. We've got Christ the King coming on board, hopefully to to do some uh, serving of dinners. This congregation has been very supportive in both the outreach and the dinners. Uh, people are gonna start asking questions. Wait a minute, what? Those guys aren't just doing the housing. What's this other thing that they're doing? We need to dream the dream for our king culture. Yeah. We need to help culture see that there's other solutions. So. And I think some, and I, I know what you're saying about you know, you're going to take the donations because that's something that we need. God's right. And God's going to bless that. And so there's certain times when you say there are both. And I know that I've got some people that that are that are in assisted living. And, and I got to I talk with them often about the things you're doing and the mm -hmm. different things going on in Fallbrook because they just can't physically go out there. And so I say, if you can't, let's let's pray for them. Let's let's intercess for them, intercess for that ministry. And if you do feel like the Lord's calling you, you can give because mm -hmm. they, they need the funds as well. But just make sure it's, it's not, it, I feel like so many times it's both and. We've got to be able to be willing to go, oh, the Lord sometimes is going to call us to write a check. Yeah, sure. But I said to somebody, I said, but why don't you write the check and deliver it? And oh. Take it. Don't just put it in the mail. Why don't you take it over there and, and say hi to Brad and then give it to Brad. And then Brad can introduce you to different people. So I think right. it just... But you're right, I think in our culture, we want to, let, let me talk to you about it a little bit more before I go. Right. Before I go. right. And that's fine. I, I'm willing to do that. I understand it's a, it's a nervous situation, uh, but I was nervous too. Sure. But, you know, I hear people say, well, I'm in Christian circles. I'm waiting for the Lord to tell me what he wants me to do. I don't think it works that way. You jump in and join the Lord. He's already working. It's not like you're having to come up with something. Right, right. He's already working. Join him where he's working, and you will encounter him, and it will change you. Change you in a big way, in a beautiful way, especially in our culture. With, with everything going on, you've you got, you got chaos, you've got confusion, you've got coercion because of yeah. the culture as compared to, and I said it last week, is that instead of being calm, cool, and collected in Christ, we start falling into the trap of the culture. Oh, yeah. And then when we do that, then, then we're not stepping out to serve the people that God has put in, in our, right in mm -hmm. front of us to serve them. And, and so we can, and Jerome has quoted this, and so many people, St. Francis of Assisi, be ready to share the love of Christ. And if you have to, use, use words. words. And I think that's so beautiful in what you're, what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. I'd like to share uh, some words with apologies to Martin Luther King because we've been talking about dreaming and imparting a dream right. to other people, which what is what he did. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to take a moment and say uh, to our online audience, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. Mm -hmm. That is, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created in the image of the living God. I have a dream that one day our hopeless cities in our hopeless cities that all children will find a home in the love of Christ. Mm. I have a dream that little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the clothes or the material goods that they have, but by the content of their character and their God-given potential. I have a dream that one day homeless encampments will be transformed and absorbed into a community of acceptance, freedom, and justice. I have a dream today 
I have a dream that one day estrangement and demonization of the homeless will stop mm. and that all citizens housed and unhoused can find their true home in the relationship with their creator. I have a dream today that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, mm. and the crooked places will be made straight, and before the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. I have a dream, and it is God's dream given to me and for me mm. and for us. Amen. Yeah. I love that. It's beautiful. Yeah. As Dreaming. We, yeah, and as, 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 as we serve a God that's a big God, he, he has us. He, he blesses us beyond what we can think or imagine, uh -huh. and we're to do the same. Absolutely. And so I think that's a beautiful picture. Anything, yeah. Brad, as we wrap up, any last words you'd like to in, impart to the online community here? Just that, just be dreamers mm -hmm. and uh, get out there and live the dream. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you, Greg. Hey, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brother here. I thank you for what he's meant to me in my life personally, to my family's lives, Lord, to my daughters, and even granddaughters, Lord Jesus, that, that see Mr. Fox here. And, and he, he loves. He loves you, and that love flows out of him to others. Because, Lord, we know we, we, we can't do this without you in us. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that you continue to anoint this ministry, Brad and the Homeless Advocacy Group, the Jesus House, Lord Jesus, bless them, as we just said, beyond what they could think or imagine. Lord, we love you, we stand in awe of you, and can't wait to see what you do next as we follow you obediently. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Amen.